Good morning. And I should say aloha as well. Uh, as I was in Hawaii last week, uh, working with uh, the pastors of um, folks that were so affected by the fire, it was a, an amazing experience, one that I was very grateful for. Of course, it's always sad. And, um, you know, I've been on a lot of disasters in my life, natural disasters. And just so you know, I don't share disaster stories. And there's a reason why I don't do that. It's because I don't want to share the pain that I saw and share that with you so you, then you have to carry the pain as well. So all I can say is that it was sad, but it was also extremely beautiful, and the food was awesome. So anyway, it's good to be back. Do we have any announcements this morning? Call to worship. Lift your eyes, seeking to know your God. Attune your spirit to the one in whom we dwell. God's love surrounds us here today. God calls us to be children of light. We belong to the day when we have faith. We live confidently in the hope of salvation. We want to in the talents God gives us. Faithfulness gives us a sense of greater abundance. To, <coughs> excuse me. Doing justice adds to our sense of worth and dignity. We are here to build up one another. May our worship encourage each of us today.
Prayer of Invocation. Fill us, gracious God, with a sense of your abiding presence. Awaken our spirits to realities unseen. Turn us in the dullness of our fear-filled grasping for security and help us to live with trust in you. Expand among us such mutual regard and encouragement as will build up community and lead us May faith and love dominate all our relationships as we enter into the joy of serving in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And now let us share in the passing of the peace. May the peace of Christ be with you all.
We had five kids come in. I guess they left before the children's sermon, darn. <laughs> the scripture lesson this morning is taken from Second Theolo- uh, Theolotians, chapter 3, verses 6 to 13. Now we commend you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is living in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you receive from me. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us. We were not idle when we were with you. We did not eat anyone's bread without paying, but with toil and labor we worked night and day that we might not burden any of you. It was not because we have not that right, but to give you in our conduct an example to imitate. For even when you were with you, we gave you this command. If any of you will not work, let them not eat. For we hear that some of you are living in idleness, mere busybodies, not doing any work. Now such persons we command and exhort in the Lord, Jesus Christ, to do their work in quietness and to earn their own living, brethren. Do not be weary in well-doing. This is the word of God for the people of God. Someone has said, and I quote, the perfect summer day is when the sun is shining, the breeze is blowing, The birds are singing, and the lawnmower is broken. (laughs) Amen to that. But scriptures today say, you don't work, guess what? You don't eat. Kind of harsh, don't you think? For me, it kind of takes my breath away. Like, what were they talking about? There's not a lot of ambiguity in that rule. For our faith, which is based on grace, it seems a bit harsh. You don't work, you don't eat. Some of us may think that we should expect that rule in our society. After all, on occasion, I think we judge people for how much they can produce or how much they can make um, or how little they are or how much they're contributing to society. But is that the way we should proceed in our faith? Should productivity be the measure by which we decide whether or not a person gets to eat? Or should that be a God-given right in our country? I grew up in a family that had an extremely strong work ethic. When it came time for me to bear the burden of what it costs to go to college. You know what my dad did? Well, he says, we can't afford you to go. And then he gave me a crescent wrench, but you can work your way. (laughs) And so I put myself through undergraduate and graduate school. The orientation in my family was don't just sit there, do something. And it was most apparent on some days, and I think they were kidding when my parents said, if you get sick, we're gonna hand you some saltine crackers and a bottle of water until you can produce something. (laughs) Of course, they actually never did that, but it gave me the idea that we all should be productive in our life, of course. And if I did goof off, all of my privileges were taken away when I couldn't do my uh, chores. My dad was not a churchgoer, but he would have agreed with Paul's words. You don't work, you don't eat, period. And this lesson is a little bit confusing on the surface. Whenever we're confused about a particular scripture lesson, we need to compare it. This is what the rabbis did many years ago, the scribes and the priests. They would compare it to another scripture lesson. So I'm going to contrast this idea, you don't work, you don't eat, with another passage found in Matthew where the day laborers went in the marketplace at dawn to get work. And so they were told if they worked a full day that they would get paid one denarius 
for working whatever, eight, 10 hours. Well, as it turned out, the foreman at four different times during the day had to go back and get more workers. And they asked, well, what will, you, what will we get paid? And he said, you'll get paid according to what you deserve. Well, as you may know, if you know scriptures, at the end of the day, um, all the workers, whether they arrived you know, for a full eight or 10 hour day or whether or not they arrived just for a one hour day, they were all paid the same, one denarius. And of course, the people that had worked all day long they were upset with this. They thought they would be getting more, but they weren't. So how do we compare that with this whole idea of, you know, you don't work, you don't eat? Well, there's actually two different subjects here that they're talking about. In Matthew, the writer of Matthew is talking about, it doesn't matter when you come to faith, whether you come to faith as a child or you come to faith as an adult, or you come to faith, you know, on your deathbed. What's most important of all is that you come to believe in God. So it doesn't matter what hour in your life you come to believe or have faith. What's most important is that you accept faith in God. And that's true whether it's from an infant baptism, you know, in the beginning, or the thief on the cross who finally accepted in the end right before his life. So it doesn't mean that, you know, it's okay to sleep in, to goof off, <laughs> grab a late brunch with a Belgian waffle, with whipped cream and fresh strawberries, catch the afternoon show of Oprah around five. And the, but eventually, if you believe in God, that's all that matters. So that's where the confusion is. It's comparing apples to oranges. In Second Theolo Theologians, which I read earlier, Paul is talking about actually how we should live, how, sh how we should function, how we should relate to others in the life of the church. Paul had a particular difficulty in Thessalonica. Some people were just goofing off. Imagine that. So guess what? We are not the only church that struggles at times with volunteers. It's been going on for a very long time. Back then, some of the members were refusing to do their share of the work. And Paul writes, in the name of Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers and sisters, to keep away from every believer who is idle and disruptive and does not live according to the teachings you receive from us. And he goes on to say, for you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone else's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked day and night laboring and tolling, knowing that we would not be a burden to any of you. We did this not because we do not have a right to such help, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you to imitate. For even when we were with you, you gave us this rule, the one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. So what do you do with the people in any church or nonprofit organization that are just goof off artists? It's true in every organization that I've been a part of. Indira Gandhi once said, there are two kinds of people, those who do the work and those that take the credit. Try to be in the first group, there's less competition. <laughs> and that's true. So Paul had this difficulty in the church. Some people in the church were faithful at serving the church while others were not. Oh, this group had many good excuses. Some of them looked down on plain everyday work. It was because of their upbringing. Some of those from Jewish backgrounds, for example, actually believed in hard work, but they felt that studying scripture was more important than physical labor. And there were the, those from the Greek background who, did, who left most of their work to their slaves and servants. And then there was some from the Thessalonian community who believed that work was no longer necessary because guess what? Jesus is coming anyway, so we just need to look good <laughs> for a little while. 
Many of us have excuses for not working and doing the things that we should be doing. Churches are a living testimony to Pareto's principle of 20% of the people do 80% of the work. And that's been true in almost every church I've served. Certain members of the church at Thessalonica, like any church, were guilty of lukewarmness. They were refusing to carry their share of the burden of the mission of the church. And I want to say for the 20% of you that do the work in this church, I am very grateful because this is an amazing place and I think we're beginning to do amazing things and with more help we can do even more. <laughs> Part of the problem is that back then some of the lukewarm Christians brought a negative spirit into the fellowship. They were not only idle, but they criticized those that did work. Paul called these negative idlers busybodies, and Paul had little use for these people. In a real way, the community here that's sitting here is like a bundle of sticks. There's great strength in being a bundle. It's very easy for one stick to be broken it's very difficult for us to break a whole bundle. And that's what's so powerful about us working together as a community, because we can get amazing things done. And the good news is that even if you don't feel like doing volunteer work, we're gonna disagree with Paul. We're still gonna feed you with coffee hour and cookies. That's part of the grace of God that gets worked out here. Believe it or not, Volunteers do get paid. Of course, not in dollars or cents, but in a much more meaningful way. When we serve in churches, we know we are in the right place, doing the right thing at the right time. That is the salary piece that happens when we receive the grace of God. And when we experience that grace, for having served in the church. It can be a deeply meaningful experience working together in community to serve uh, the common good. I want to acknowledge, though, that even when we serve, there can also be a lot of frustrations. <laughs> it just happens. Guess what? We're a human experience. The level of stress went from three when I came in to almost 10 when we couldn't find the lid to the coffee pot this morning. <laughs> and so we almost, and that's just part of the frustrations of being in, in church. Things do happen, but it doesn't take away from that fundamental sense of well-being that we get when we serve others in the church community. For God touches us as we touch the lives of others. And for that, we should be especially grateful during this season of Thanksgiving. Amen. And now let us stand and sing 461, Come ye thankful people, come.
be seated. And just as a reminder, there is a, I know she uh, mentioned it earlier, there is a puppet show today at three o'clock in the um, Fellowship Hall. So if you have grandchildren or children that you'd like to bring, please do so. And there's a rumor that there'll be ice cream afterwards. So we shall see today at three o'clock. So let us pray. Loving and gracious God, you have reminded us through your scripture lesson today the importance of sharing some of our gifts in the community of the church. We pray that by your spirit that you empower us to make a difference in our community. Help us to take that next step to serve you. We pray for <coughs> so many overseas. We think about Israel and Palestine and, and all the other wars that are happening around this world, especially those that don't get much news. We pray for those that are struggling in Hawaii as they are trying to find homes after theirs were burned down and lives lost. We pray that their time of grief may be swift and we pray that they can return to a sense of joy in living in such a beautiful area of our world. We pray for the leaders of this church. We pray for the search committee as they do their diligent work to find a settled pastor. And we pray for those for whom the season of Thanksgiving and Christmas can be a difficult time. We know that for some it's difficult because we, have, we only have memories of good times which happened a long time ago. So help those of us that are cast down during this holiday season, which some call the blue season. All this we ask and say in the name of him who taught us to pray by saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. It's not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And now let us continue to worship God through the giving and receiving of our morning offering.
Let us say together our prayer of dedication. There is no escape from your judgment, O Spirit of holiness, but neither can we flee beyond your limitless love. We offer an accounting of our stewardship in and beyond the offering of this day. Reshape our lives for joyous, responsive participation in work that builds up the body of Christ. Use what we have for here to bring encouragement and hope to many who have lost a sense of meaning for their lives. Bless us and our offering. Amen. And now let us sing as our closing hymn, We Gather Together. Now with the spirit of thanksgiving, go in peace. Amen.